Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's 12.01, so we'll go ahead and get started. We may have a couple more people join us over the next few minutes, and I'll try to admit them as they sign in. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome each of you to our latest Nevada chapter of the American Planning Association online educational luncheon. Uh, my name is Fred Steinman. I'm the director for the Northern section of the Nevada chapter of the American Planning Association. Um, and it's my pleasure to welcome all of you to today's educational luncheon. Uh, I'll be uh, presenting an overview of some of the research uh, that I've been working on as a faculty member with the College of Business at the University of Nevada, Reno, uh, regarding the impacts of COVID-19 on the state's fiscal system. Um, just in way of a couple of quick announcements, uh, for those of you that are members of the Nevada chapter of the American Planning Association, uh, we are currently accepting nominations for our annual De Beers Awards in planning. Uh, Amber Harmon uh, has sent out an email uh, to the membership as well as the Northern Section members. Um, if you have any interest in submitting a nomination for yourself, your organization, or on behalf of somebody else, uh, please contact Amber directly where you can email me at fred, F-R-E-D, at unr.edu, and I would be more than happy to put you in touch with Amber. Uh, this is kind of a continuing series uh, for the northern section of the Nevada APA. Uh, usually the section does a monthly brown bag luncheon, and of course with the current uh, COVID-19 pandemic and some of the social distancing protocols uh, that we're all having to still deal with, um, the northern section has decided to do one of these every two weeks. Uh, two weeks ago, uh, we had the RTC of Washoe County uh, present an overview of the RTC's 2050 Regional Transportation Plan. Uh, that presentation is available uh, online on the chapter's YouTube, YouTube chapter. Uh, all you need to do is just search in YouTube for Nevada APA, uh, and you'll find our chapter's YouTube channel. Uh, this presentation will also be recorded, and I will, uh, with other members of the chapter, uh, be sure to post uh, this presentation online uh, so that you can watch it again or share it with friends, uh, other people that are interested in seeing the presentation. Uh, in two weeks, uh, scheduled for Tuesday, June 10, 2020, uh, we'll have another representative from the RTC of Washoe County, uh, as well as a representative from the Reno Tahoe International Airport, talk about the impacts of COVID-19 on their organizations, how COVID-19 has impacted transportation planning, and what both organizations are doing to address the current pandemic to ensure public health and human safety in the world of transportation. With that in mind, it's now my pleasure to go ahead and start the presentation. Uh, as a reminder, this presentation is being recorded, um, so if you can, please keep your microphones muted. Uh, my presentation will go about 30 or so minutes, and then after my presentation, we can open it up to Q&A and larger discussion. Uh, so with that, let me bring up the presentation, and we can go ahead and get started. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, my work as an assistant research professor uh, here at the College of Business at the University of Nevada, Reno, uh, we've been working very closely with the Nevada Governor's Office of Economic Development, as well as other public, municipal, county governments, and economic development authorities in the state uh, to really try to get a sense of the impacts of COVID-19 on the state's fiscal system. Uh, and to a certain degree, how those impacts are also translating into impacts at the local, municipal, and county level. Um, I'm going to be kind of beginning with a general overview of the history of Nevada's fiscal system so you have a bit of a context uh, to how a major disruptive event like COVID-19 could impact the state's fiscal system in both the short and long term and then kind of turn my attention towards some of the specific impacts that we're anticipating on the state's economy and more specifically uh, on the state's fiscal system. 
uh, with that in mind, see if I can get the slide to move, uh, it's important to kind of keep in mind, in a lot of ways, Nevada's fiscal system is truly a black box, uh, in that the, the state's fiscal system has been designed in such a way in which inputs from the tax base, uh, which is generated through general economic activity, will produce tax revenue. Uh, but one of the problems with Nevada's fiscal system is it's a highly unpredictable system uh, in that changes in the external environment on the tax base uh, result in unpredictable impacts on tax revenues that, that the state government and its general fund will collect or that local municipalities, counties, school districts, and other local taxing entities uh, will also collect uh, from one fiscal year to the next. Uh, one question that this black box kind of raises is really how susceptible um, and to a certain degree how sustainable is our state's fiscal system in the wake of these unpredictable external shocks such as terrorist attacks, global pandemics, or other events that are hard to define and hard to predict. Uh, and because they're hard to define and hard to predict, it's also very difficult to predict and determine what the end out and impact of those external shocks are going to be. Um, not to kind of ring my own bell and you know trumpet my own horn, but I've been studying Nevada's fiscal system for 20 years now. Uh, I'd like to think I'm one of the more knowledgeable people when it comes to knowing how our state's fiscal system works. And I maybe understand about 15 or 20 percent of it. Um, and a large part of that unpredictability and unknown of Nevada's fiscal system is really a function of our state's history and the way we've kind of cobbled together a fiscal system throughout the state's history. Kind of with all of that in mind, we can kind of turn our attention uh, to understanding that the problem of unpredictability and a lack of sustainability in Nevada's fiscal system is really nothing new. Um, in a lot of ways, it was kind of built that way. Uh, Romanzo Adams, uh, back, way back when in 1918, uh, 50 or so years after Nevada's statehood, uh, wrote a book called Taxation in Nevada History. Uh, because they were experiencing the same problems regarding the predictability of revenue at the state level that we deal with today in 2020. And Romanzo kind of traced these impacts or the lack of predictability to the way in which Nevada's fiscal system has been built. Um, and since Romanzo has continued to be built year after year, decade after decade. He makes the argument that Nevada's quirkiness or uniqueness in the way in which we became a state um, in that there was no such thing as kind of a quote-unquote established population um, in, in terms of a, a state government organization. Uh, and as the state's population grew, as individuals moved to the state of Nevada, they brought with them their own traditions and ways of doing things, policies, procedures, and fiscal system, and over time kind of cobbled together um, to a certain degree, almost kind of a Frankenstein-esque uh, type fiscal system. Um, and where individuals settled within the state also had an impact uh, in terms of how that fiscal system uh, would be developed over time. Romanzo continues by essentially saying that, you know, at the end of the day, in order to understand Nevada's system of taxation, you really have to have a first understanding of the main features of the state's economy or economic base, uh, as well as the physical conditions that have controlled the development of that fiscal base. Um, we kind of use this very basic equation in fiscal policy to estimate revenue from one year to the next, where tax revenue is simply a function of taking a tax rate, be it a property tax rate or a sales tax rate or a business license rate, and multiplying that to a base. And the tax base is generally thought of as a function of the economic base. Uh, so as your economy grows, as it diversifies, as industry sectors and occupation sectors grow and evolve over time, that's going to also impact the tax base uh, upon which we generate public revenues to provide a variety of public services. 
But we, we find that this type of approach where revenue is equal to the rate times the base works well in terms of being predictable and sustainable when the economic base is also diverse. Unfortunately, as we'll show, as I'll show you in a little bit, uh, Nevada uh, is a very non-diverse state in terms of its overall economic base. Despite the work that the Governor's Office of Economic Development and various local governments and economic development authorities have done over the years to attempt to diversify the state's economy. Uh, just to, again, kind of quickly go over this brief history of Nevada's fiscal system. Uh, prior to statehood, Nevada was, again, part of the Utah Territory. Uh, and then when the state of Utah was, was created, Nevada itself was renamed the Nevada Territory. And then only a few short years, Nevada was admitted to the Union as the 36th state. Um, with only about 43,000 total people living in the state at the time, well short of the 60,000 required for actual statehood. Uh, Nevada is kind of a, is quirky in terms of its economic system in that there's no such thing really as a Nevada economy. Um, we can measure something that we call the Nevada economy, the sum of all economic activity and employment and transactions that occur within the state's boundaries. But that doesn't necessarily mean that the state's economy is one actual economy. Uh, Nevada's history of being a territory and being transformed into a state uh, really has kind of created a series of regional economies with not a lot of interconnectivity between them. Uh, certainly, the Reno Sparks larger Western Nevada region uh, probably has more in common and more economic tie to the California Bay Area and the Pacific Northwest than it does with Clark County, Southern Nevada, um, or Eastern Nevada. In Eastern Nevada, with Elko County and other counties like Lander and Eureka and White Pine, probably have more in common with Southern Idaho and Utah than it does with Clark or Washoe County. And then, of course, Clark County in Southern Nevada uh, is very much tied to more of a global economic system and a supra regional economy uh, than it is with Western or Eastern Nevada. Uh, and as a result of that, we've developed kind of a mixed, again, kind of Frankenstein-isk uh, type fiscal system to kind of acknowledge the fact that we don't have a single Nevada economic base or single Nevada tax base. Uh, we've had to kind of create a fiscal system that recognizes multiple eco e economic regions operating within one state. Uh, prior to the 1950s, our economic base was dominated by mining and agriculture. Uh, but uh, beginning in the 1940s, uh, as we began to urbanize and hotel casino gaming and resort gaming became a thing, uh, we really saw the economic base begin to shift uh, from one based on agriculture and mining to one based on tourism, gaming, uh, and hotel activity. Um, if we kind of fast forward a little bit uh, between 1945 to 1981, uh, thanks to the you know development of you know jet aircrafts, uh, tourism um, as well as general economic activity in the south uh, of the state really kind of drives a lot drives a lot of our population growth. Uh, in fact, from 1945 to 1981, the state's total population grew from about 150,000 uh, to just over 880,000, a near 500% increase in less than 40 years. Uh, but as we saw, and as we see between that 1945 to 1981 period, almost all the growth in the state's population was con concentrated in Washoe and Clark counties, uh, with a little bit being concentrated in Carson City. Uh, as that population began to really kind of concentrate and centralize in two or three counties within the state, uh, the Nevada legislature in the early 1980s began to realize that the fiscal system that had been cobbled together from statehood up to 1981 was no longer serving the interests of the state and its population. Uh, 
Uh, so the legislature created what they call and what we affectionately refer to as the tax shift, where we move the primary revenue source of local government as well as state government revenue from a dependency on property tax revenue to sales tax revenue. Um, and that shift was largely done because Nevada was losing its rural roots uh, in fiscal policy uh, for states and communities uh, with more of a rural orientation in terms of its economic base, being more dependent upon industry sectors like mining and agriculture, a property tax makes sense. And that's because it's predictable, right? You can you know, provide an adequate and reasonable estimation of the value of mining assets and agricultural assets because it's land-based. And once you do that, you can then develop a fiscal system that'll capture the cost of providing services to those assets. But as economies become more urban, uh, a property tax really begins to fail to capture uh, the estimation of what the economic base and the tax base is actually worth. Um, largely because a lot of the economic activity is no longer tangible. There's no actual value in terms of the physical property. Uh, value and economic value is non-tangible. You know, if you look at like a hotel casino, the value of the building, the four walls and a roof that is a casino floor is not where the economic value lies. The economic value lies in the transactions that are occurring um, you know, at slot machines, at table games, and the purchasing of taxable retail commodities. Um, but in order to kind of continue to match uh, the provision of services to the growth of the economy and the population, you need to shift from a property tax system to a sales tax system. Uh, this is, of course, good uh, for more urban or metropolitan communities like Las Vegas, Reno Spar Sparks, and to a certain degree, Carson City and Douglas County, uh, but it becomes problematic for rural communities that may not have the subsequent sales tax activity to kind of support uh, the provision of public services. By 2018, after we kind of go through this big history, it's fair to say, and this may you know, be a bit controversial to some of you, uh, Nevada is really by now firmly established as an urban state. Uh, nearly 90% of the state's total population lives within two of our three metropolitan areas, the Las Vegas metropolitan area in Clark County and the Reno Sparks metropolitan area in Washoe County. Uh, with maybe another percentage or two located in the Carson City metro area. Um, that high level of concentration of population in established metropolitan areas really makes Nevada uh, not only a, urban, a firmly urban state, but actually one of the most urban states in the United States, uh, even compared to larger population states that have population distributed more evenly between metropolitan communities and non-metro or rural communities. Uh, in 2005, uh, of course, many of you are familiar uh, with the move that the legislature made to establish uh, property tax caps, or what we call the abatements. Uh, these property tax caps or abatements are, were established in order to limit the amount of growth uh, in actual property tax paid from individual properties. Uh, this, of course, along with the tax shift, uh, was kind of Nevada's response to California's Proposition 13 without going as far as Proposition 13 did in California. Uh, in 2005 and into 2006, 7, and 8, prior to the Great Recession, we saw considerable inflation uh, in property values and housing prices throughout the state. Uh, and the legislature made the determination to ensure that people were not taxed out of their homes to ensure that property tax revenue could not grow more than 3% on residential properties or up to 8% on commercial non-residential properties from one year to the next. Uh, we use kind of a blended rate to determine what the abatement is for individual communities throughout the state. Uh, and over the last several years, it's averaged about three and a quarter percent. Um, 
again, for non-metro or more rural communities, this has been particularly uh, or a source of particular frustration uh, because whereas the Las Vegas metro area, the, the Reno Sparks metro area, and the Carson City metro area can offset the lost revenue from the property tax caps with sales tax revenue, our more rural or non-metro communities simply cannot. Uh, although as part of the tax shift, we also established the guaranteed county status, which kind of added another element of complexity uh, in the way in which sales tax revenue is collected and distributed throughout the state. One thing that we know as kind of a basic summation of this history uh, is that we have seen as the state's population and economy continues to grow, there's been a fairly predictable increase uh, in the demand for services uh, to support that economic and population growth. Uh, but one thing that we also see year after year, especially from a state standpoint, um, is that we haven't been able to stimulate and generate enough public revenues uh, to keep pace with the need to pay for those increased services. Uh, that's been very true at the state level, and I imagine at the local government level, that's been very true as well, with some notable exceptions uh, in individual parts of the state. Uh, right here, uh, we have kind of a breakdown of the state fiscal system and kind of some of the top revenue uh, generating categories for the state budget uh, for the coming fiscal year for fiscal year 2020 and 21. Uh, these numbers were provided by the Nevada Economic Forum and the Interim Finance Committee. I'll make a, a, a bit of a, you know, exception to this, these numbers have not been revised down uh, due to the impacts of COVID-19. Uh, and it's likely there will be a significant reduction in these revenues for the coming fiscal year. Uh, in fact, as many of you know, Governor Sislak uh, has already instituted a 4% cut in state spending for the current fiscal year that will end in about a month, and then an additional 12% reduction uh, in state expenditures for fiscal year 2021. And that's largely, again, due to the projected declines uh, in revenue coming from these various sources. Uh, but what I want to kind of illustrate in this particular slide, and this kind of ties into trying to figure out the impacts of COVID-19 on the state's fiscal system, uh, is that a very few set of sources of revenue account for a very large chunk uh, of the revenue that the state government uh, has to spend from one fiscal year to the next. Uh, in fact, if you kind of take a look at the top 16 or top six uh, revenue sources, state sales and use tax revenue, uh, gaming percentage fees, the MBT, the insurance premium tax, commerce tax, and the cigarette tax, those six sources account for 81% of projected total revenue for the state of Nevada. Uh, and then, of course, it begins to kind of fall off in terms of actual importance or contribution to the state budget with the live entertainment tax, business license fees, uh, the state's portion of the property tax, and then the mining tax or the net proceeds tax. Um, and as, of course, many of you know, um, you know, the social distancing protocols, the response to COVID-19 in Nevada uh, has resulted in temporary and in some cases permanent closure of various commercial retail businesses throughout the state. And to a certain degree, maybe more importantly, uh, every single gaming property within the state of Nevada. Uh, those are our two top sources of revenue to the state budget. Uh, hence the reason for the reduction in spending for the coming fiscal year. Um, this gets a little more interesting when we start to look at year-by-year -year breakdowns of total revenue collected by the state of Nevada from one year to the next. Uh, really to illustrate that even despite COVID-19, Nevada's fiscal system has really been cobbled together in a way that does not meet uh, increased needs in public spending to provide services to a growing population and a growing economic system. Uh, from 2012 to 2018, in this seven-year period, uh, you see four of the seven years, we've actually seen decreases in the total amount of revenue. That's from every single source, sales tax, 
uh, net proceeds, the MBT, uh, gaming revenue, everything that the state has collected in that particular year. So four out of seven years of decline in state revenues. Now, keep that in context with the idea that from 2012 to 2018 and into 2019, uh, the state economy has seen remarkable economic growth and expansion uh, in a post-Great Recession world but you have a fiscal system here that is not sensitive to those economic changes um, in that revenue has continued to decline from one period to the next. Um, in fact, if you kind of average out or even out those increases and de decreases from 2012 to 2018, total revenue collected by the state of Nevada has only increased at an average rate of about 1.3%. Um, while the state's total population has increased by about 10% over that same six, seven year period. That becomes even kind of more evident when we look at the expenditure side of the state budget uh, and the state fiscal system. So remember, between 2012 and 2018, you had more periods of decrease in revenue than you had periods of increase. But if we look at expenditures over that same seven year period, five of the seven years between 2012 and 2018 saw an increase in actual expenditures with increasing expenditures occurring in 2014, 15, 16, 17, and 18. Now, again, the state's population increased by 10% over this period and averaging out these increases and decreases you see that you know a, that the state's uh, total expenditures in each year has increased by about 11.2 percent, which is again consistent with total population growth. And again, you would expect that as population grows, as economic activity increases, there's an increased demand in public services. We need more roads, we need more schools, we need more police officers and firefighters, we need more healthcare workers, all the things that the state and local governments provide to support a growing population and a growing economic system. And again, expenditures from one year to the next have increased over time. But again, we're faced with the realization that the fiscal system has been unable to keep up with that increased expenditure from one year to the next. So some key takeaways before we kind of finish up this presentation with an overview of some of the impacts. Uh, time and time again, Nevada's fiscal system is typically ranked one of the most non-diverse fiscal systems uh, in the United States. Um, and as a result of that, Nevada's fiscal system has really become very, very sensitive uh, to global, national, regional, and even statewide economic shocks, especially on the recession side of the equation. In fact, prior to the recession of 2001, that was a function of the 9-11 uh, terrorist attacks in Washington, D.C., in New York, and Pennsylvania, um, we thought for the longest time Nevada was recession-proof. Uh, but as we became more urban as a state uh, with a fiscal system that really didn't match those changing realities, uh, we learned in 2001 and then certainly in 2008 and 2010 that Nevada has become increasingly susceptible to those more larger uh, global, national, regional, uh, and even statewide economic uh, shocks. Uh, Nevada's fiscal system as a result of kind of the hodgepodge collection of fiscal policies uh, has resulted in a fiscal system that's highly dependent uh, on just a few uh, key revenue sources. Uh, and as a result of that, the state's fiscal system has also failed to really kind of keep pace uh, with the increased demand that we've seen for public services at both the state and local level. Uh, worse yet, it's almost become a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy uh, in that there is a strong incentivization within the fiscal system for local governments in particular to engage in what we call the fiscalization of land use. Um, I, I don't think this is a direct and willful um, approach, uh, but just a simple response to a very limited tax base and a very limited economic base in trying to maximize public revenues at a local level, but also at a state level as well. 
trying to encourage those aspects of the economy that will generate the maximum amount of revenue. Uh, but again, that becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy to a certain degree, because as you continue to fiscalize land use and focus on a narrow tax base and, an econ and a narrow economic base, you also continue to narrow the sources of revenue that local governments and state government can collect. And again, the proof is in the result that 80% of state government revenues come from only six revenue sources. And if there's any type of disruption in one of those six or more sources, you see significant impacts materialized on reductions in expenditures moving forward. So let's talk about quickly COVID-19 and what, what has been referred to as kind of the economics of, of fear. Uh, Adam Rose uh, is the director of the Center for Risk and Economic Analysis of Terrorism Events at the uh, University of Southern California Sol Price School of Public Policy. And I, along with Tom Harris, the director of the University Center for Economic Development, uh, we're working closely with Adam to kind of model these economic impacts of COVID-19 in Nevada uh, and in different Western U.S. states. And Adam, way back when in 2011, uh, made the argument that extreme negative events, not traditional recessions, but shocks like a terrorist attack or a global pandemic um, really can jolt a socioeconomic system in a way that creates a high degree of uncertainty in terms of the proper response from a policy or fiscal policy standpoint. Uh, as opposed to a regular recession, uh, recessions solve themselves once the underlying economic imbalance has been solved. Uh, but with a terrorist attack or a global pandemic, you really need the fear to first subside. And it's difficult to really you know, make any type of policy response that is going to be appropriate until that fear and that initial event has been resolved, usually outside the control of policymakers moving forward. Um, so if we kind of take Adam's, you know, thoughts about these types of shocks and apply them to COVID-19 in Nevada uh, to really kind of determine what the economic and fiscal impacts are going to be, uh, we really need to look back at not the Great Recession of 2008 through 2010, as that was kind of what I would call a more traditional recession due to an economic market failure and look back to the impacts of the 9-11 terrorist attacks, uh, which was the last type of unpredictable shock similar to something like COVID-19. And what you see that statewide unemployment in the state reached its peak uh, in December 2001 as a result of the 9-11 terrorist attacks, uh, but within five months, unemployment within the state began to decline. Uh, and between 2001 and 2002, uh, state median household income and state per capita income for Nevada uh, declined by just less than 1% between 2001 and 2002, with actually no decline in statewide GDP over this period. And this kind of illustrates the fact that once the fear subsides, once individuals are willing to get back on an airplane, come to Las Vegas, or travel to Tahoe, or enjoy the Great Basin, uh, the economic maladjustment that was occurring within the system kind of corrects itself, and you go back to whatever long-term growth curve that we had been on. While this is useful um, to kind of give us a general sense of maybe how long these economic impacts will last, it certainly doesn't give us any sense of the scale of the economic impact that we're dealing with in Nevada. Um, as you can see, between November and February of 2019, uh, the state was enjoying exceptionally low unemployment. Uh, and very high levels of economic growth and activity as we continue to rebound from the Great Recession. Uh, March 2020, we begin uh, the social distancing programs and the mandatory closure of businesses throughout the state. Uh, unemployment begins to accelerate very quickly, going to 6.9% in March of 2020. And then as many of you probably have read already, in April 2020, the Federal Reserve uh, and the Bureau of Labor and Statistics estimates that Nevada's unemployment has skyrocketed to 28.2%. And again, that's not necessarily 
you know, unpredictable. When you close a good portion of the state's economy, which we did, especially a good portion of the state's economic base, which is centered in Clark County and the Las Vegas Strip, those unemployment numbers are going to rocket. Uh, what we don't have is estimates for statewide GDP or median household income or per capita income. Uh, those numbers will likely come within the next quarter, and we'll probably see similar impacts and reductions uh, consistent with the percentage increases on unemployment. Again, similar to kind of what we saw in the relationship between the rise in unemployment and decreases in median household and per capita income during the 9-11 terrorist attacks. Again, the scale doesn't match up well, but potentially uh, what we have is some optimism uh, that these impacts will be short-lived. If the 9-11 terrorist attacks will give us any, uh, you know, general indication of how long those impacts can last. Uh, however, uh, working with the Governor's Office of Economic Development uh, and using what's called a CGE model uh, that Adam Rose has developed um, at USC, uh, we're actually predicting that the economic impacts of COVID-19 in the state of Nevada will last far longer than the impacts of the 9-11 terrorist attacks. Uh, what you have here are three different scenarios for four general measures of economic activity in Nevada. Uh, it's predicted that unemployment will, one year from today, uh, be up, best case, 9%, uh, worst case, up 19%, uh, likely about up 13% from where we are today. Uh, job growth, uh, again, best case, down 7%. Uh, likely case down 11% and in a worst case scenario be down 16%. Uh, and of course, given how dependent upon the state's fiscal system is to gaming and tourism, uh, the mark declines best case to worst case in visitor counts uh, one year from today is particularly disturbing uh, with a kind of corresponding decline in taxable retail sales. Now again, put that in the context of where the state's budget is and its revenue system is. State sales and use tax account for about 30% of the state budget and gaming percentage fees or gaming gross tax revenue accounts for just under 18%. And the models that we've been able to kind of predict show visitor counts being down 13 to 34% within a year from today and taxable retail sales being down 11% to 22%. Uh, one year from today as well. And one of the problems that we have here is that as opposed to the 9-11 terrorist attacks, we're very dependent upon the response of other nations from across the globe. Um, other nations continue to impose restrictions on travel to and from foreign nations of their indigenous populations. Um, and for Clark County, that has on average about 40 million visitors per year. That's a fairly sizable chunk of potential visitors essentially not allowed to travel uh, to Las Vegas to take part of the various gaming and recreation activities there. And then on top of that, you have the continued impacts of the economics of fear or fear economics. How willing and when are people going to feel comfortable going back into public spaces and going to the casinos, going to the hotels, going to small business and restaurants and consuming again? And unfortunately, we don't have a good sense of that um, as the predictable trends of COVID-19 um, are becoming increasingly difficult to kind of predict one region of the globe to, a, to another. Um, so again, just to kind of sum up these various impacts, um, with about 80% of our state fiscal system at the state level being tied uh, to a very small number of potential revenue sources, uh, the state has really already taken action uh, on the expenditure side. Uh, with 4% uh, cuts already occurring to the current fiscal year, and then an additional 12% being made to the coming fiscal year of 2020-21. Um, after that, um, it becomes very difficult to predict, uh, although it's very likely that additional cuts beyond 12% will be needed uh, for the coming biennium uh, when the legislature sits in January of next year. Um, so just kind of as a, as a quick takeaway, um, the, the impacts are severe um, and will likely to be severe for the next 365 days. 
Uh, and as those impacts at the state level continue to unravel and unfold, we'll likely see those impacts begin to roll down to the local government. Uh, and municipalities, counties, school districts, and other local taxing entities uh, will have to essentially balance the revenue and expenditure equation uh, with additional cuts. Uh, to local government spending, uh, which will again really be translated uh, by cuts uh, in state government spending. Uh, with that, I'm more than happy to take any questions that you may have or, you know, look uh, at this data a little bit more. Um, if you have any questions, just unmute and we can get into it. Uh, Fred, this is Floyd Rowley. Um, with respect to the uh, current state taxation policy. I understand that the, um, the law never um, anticipated a rebound from a, a decline. In other words, uh, there, there's no cap on going back up after, as it turns out, we, we lost a ton of valuation in the last recession. Uh, it's absolutely right. In fact, prior to COVID-19, one of the projects uh, Tom Harris and I were working on uh, was really trying to get a sense of the impacts of the abatements or the property tax caps. Uh, and we've been looking at every single municipality, county, and school district in the state that are heavily dependent upon property tax. And one thing that we found is that due to the abatements, there wasn't a single local government in the state of Nevada that got back to pre-Great Recession property tax levels collected. Uh, and that was because the decline between 2008 and 2010 was so severe um, that we created these kind of artificial floors on how much we could get in terms of recovery or, or, or ceilings in terms of recovery. So if your jurisdiction between 2008 and 2010 saw a decline of say, you know, 50% in total property tax revenue collected, you to figure out how many years it takes just through normal appreciation to get back to pre great recession levels, you take 50% divide by the effective property tax cap about three and a quarter percent, and that gives you the number of years, far longer than the decade of economic recovery that we've expended, we've experienced. So we've never even recovered, at least on the property tax side, from the impacts of the Great Recession. And while Clark County and Washoe County, to a certain degree, Douglas and Carson City can almost kind of work around because they can pull from sales tax revenue, the remaining counties that are still very much rural and don't have the sales tax revenue to offset that have been just constantly behind the curve. Uh, and the tax shift and the guaranteed county status that some of those counties enjoy wasn't enough to essentially make up for that lost property tax revenue. Uh, so going into COVID-19 as, as Floyd correctly points out, we were already at a significant disadvantage in terms of our fiscal system, never really getting back to great recession levels. And now here we are with another major economic cataclysm resulting in near 30% unemployment and massive reductions again in likely total assessed value and predicted property tax revenues moving forward. And it's going to have to be an issue that the legislature addresses, hopefully, um, because right now, and I'm preaching to the choir here, a lot of local governments are probably starting to feel this squeeze again. Frederick, I have a question for you. It's Max with Tim Lewis Communities. How are you? Very good, Max. Good. Um, I've heard a lot of people speculate, uh, especially with California's more stringent response to the COVID that we might see emigration from California and in general from metropolitan areas out to more rural areas. And they're hopeful that that might benefit us with respect to population growth and, and housing demand and whatnot as people try to evacuate California and, and maybe come our way. Are you seeing any data to support that theory or do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, it's probably too early uh, to see any, anything. Um, and I seriously doubt anyone, you know, in any measurable way is looking to move and relocate right now as we're, again, still, dealing with the impacts of COVID-19. Uh, it, it's a thing about like a terrorist attack or a pandemic that's unique from other recessions in that you add this fear element 
right? This, this economics of fear. Uh, people are hunkered down and we're kind of watching this train wreck still unfold uh, in real time. Um, so it's difficult to kind of, you know, determine right now whether or not we're anticipating another, you know, kind of mass migration into the state. Uh, it's possible um, for sure. Um, and if it's anything like what we've seen in the previous decade, Nevada will continue to experience pretty sizable population growth uh, in kind of maybe a post-pandemic world. Um, but again, you add more population, that's an increased demand for public services as the result of new population. And the fiscal system, at least at the state level, uh, as we saw looking at 2012 to 2018, just hasn't kept pace. Uh, so if there is additional population growth, that's likely going to be additional stress on the state's fiscal system, a fiscal system that's already pretty stressed as is. Uh, but it's just too early to determine whether or not there's going to be any type of quote unquote mass population migration to Nevada from California or other states uh, as a result of COVID-19. Frank, uh, this is Art Rangel. Very, go very good presentation. Uh, are you or GOAD or anyone gonna be sharing this presentation with uh, municipalities or others, uh, EDON, folks like that? Uh, we, we have been. Uh, the Governor's Office of Economic Development has been meeting weekly with all the various regional economic development authorities, uh, providing updated estimates to impacts on unemployment, and, you know, job growth declines, visitor count, sales tax revenue, and other things. So that's been happening on a weekly basis for the last two months. Uh, myself um, and Tom Harris at USAID, uh, we've been actively engaging our contacts at the local government level as well. Uh, and of course, I know that, you know, here today with us during this meeting, there are probably a lot of local government representatives, municipal, county, school district staff. Um, so we're sharing that information in real time right now. Um, and we'll post this information on the chapter's website and the chapter's YouTube. It's all public information. All the data we've collected and analyzed is from publicly available sources. Uh, so there's nothing proprietary about any of this. Um, Thank you. Fred, yeah. Fred, John, Krampotic, are, are, are we, is there a, is there a queue of questions or are we just? Uh, go, go for it, John, you jumped, jumped in. in. Thank you. Just jump in. Um, you, you talked a lot about fiscal. I really hope, and I know you'll do your part, and there's a lot of wonderful people on this screen I see, that uh, need to put the pressure on electeds about the fiscal basis for land use decisions. This has been a cliche at best in the past because if three NIMBY show up, you know the game, right? That trumps fiscal criteria, which is mind boggling when you think about all that goes into land use decisions in the many, many millions of dollars that are created with a development project based on a land use decision. So I really hope that, it seems like it's gonna be more critical than ever. And I do see one, uh, elected official on. I didn't scroll down the screen, so I don't know who's here, but I see uh, Lori Bagwell. So I think that's, I'm glad to see you, Lori. Um, the other thing, and with respect to one of your slides, just making sure I understand it, you say job growth will re be reduced by, are you actually saying job loss, or are you saying the growth rate will be positive, but reduced by the percent you showed on the screen? There's a huge so, difference. Let me let me bring that back. Do you know up. what I'm saying? Yeah. It was one of your last slides. I'll let me let me bring that up right now. I can I, I know I kind of went through it quickly. So with job growth, um, as, essentially that should say job loss up seven percent, job loss up eleven percent, job loss up sixteen percent. Um, so just negative job growth, right? We'll, we'll, we'll see actual reductions in the total number of people employed in actual positions. And those numbers pretty you know, closely resemble the impacts on unemployment. So as job growth goes down, we'd expect unemployment to go up. Um, it, just, just kind of a different way of looking at the, at, at, the, at the same phenomenon, right? People losing their jobs. Uh, we've seen over the last decade since, you know, recovery from the Great Recession, unemployment in the state go down and job growth go way up very quickly. 
uh, as more people move into the state um, to fill positions created by new businesses, um, expanded businesses, and we're looking at kind of a flip of that scenario now. Um, you know, if you're a resort property, if you're a small business, there's only so long that you can continue to play or pay employees um, with your business closed with no revenue stream. Um, and the longer that businesses remain closed, not making a judgment on public health or safety, it's just kind of the fact of the matter, the longer the business is closed and the longer they have to deal with no revenue, uh, they're going to have to start, and they already have eliminating positions. Um, so, John, I, I, I hope that answered your question. If John's still with us, hopefully so. Um, to, to kind of quickly talk about the, the fiscalization um, of land use, uh, my heart goes out in a lot of ways uh, to local governments uh, throughout the state because they're kind of caught in a in an impossible situation, right? You know, where they don't have, we, in Nevada, because we're a Dillon's Law state, local governments don't have the ability to make their own tax policy. Uh, we're dependent upon in local government uh, what the legislature determines for us. Um, we have a lot of autonomy on the expenditure side of the equation, but really no autonomy in terms of our, our, our creation of revenues. Um, so local governments are really kind of caught in a poor incentive system. You know, they have a limited tax base. They're seeing increase in demand for services one year after the next increase and a very limited way to generate the revenues needed to meet growth and expenditures. Um, so you just become kind of naturally incentivized to chase development that is gonna maximize revenue from your limited revenue sources. Um, so it's not really a statement of good or bad, but just kind of a, a realization of where we are in, in Nevada. Any other questions? Fred, it's Jeff. <clears throat> Have you heard any murmurings from um, folks at the legislature um, of reviving um, property tax reform? Uh, it, we, we have an election, of course, coming in November, which means we'll have a new legislature, a new assembly, and a new Senate uh, for the next legislative session, which begins early next year. Okay. Um, so I think it's a, it's a little premature. Um, I, I know that um, several members of the assembly and the Senate, um, not to call anybody out, but there have been members in both the Assembly and the Senate prior to COVID-19 uh, that were really seriously talking about um, not only the fiscal system as a whole, but specifically the property tax abatements and trying to figure out a more equitable arrangement. Um, and several of them you know, made it very clear that they weren't necessarily in favor of just doing away with the caps because quite honestly, the caps serve a very useful function. Um, you know, if we could put ourselves back in 2005, six, seven, and eight, um, the inflation in property values and the resulting increases in property tax bills were putting people on fixed incomes out of their homes. And that's unacceptable, right? You, you know, let's not add to the homeless problem we have by taxing people out of their homes. And I think the legislature responded in a reasonable way and saying, we can't really do anything about tapping down inflation on housing prices and property, but we can do something in terms of tapping down the increases in property tax bills that people were seeing one year to the next. But, but again, this is the law of unintended consequences. And as Floyd pointed out, Sure, you put a ceiling on the revenue, but you didn't put a floor on the fall, right? right. So you could fall. So there was no reassessment upon, upon point of sale. So you never captured the value increase upon point of sale. And even though you were no longer punishing people that were still in their properties. And in California, the legislature in California has been considering legislation because we modeled our 
property tax abatements very closely on what Prop 13 was in California. And now California is like, oh boy, we didn't really think about the floor on the fall side. So they're considering, you know, some legislation to prevent fall by maybe reassessing property based upon sale, which they kind of do already. Nevada, we don't. We have a weird property tax system in that we you know, separate the value of the land from the value of the improvements. And the value of the improvements is based upon depreciation. Nothing to do with market value, but value of land is based upon market value. Right. And then you, we try to combine them to figure out what the total assessed value is. Uh, and there have been prominent members of the legislature in both the assembly and the Senate uh, that have floated the idea of maybe re uh, looking at the way in which we assess property, both land and improvements, and how that as assessment is recalculated. Uh, because at least with a sale, you have a market data point, right? You know now what that property is actually worth. Um, and, and that might be approached. Whether or not the legislature actually does it in the next session, no idea. And I imagine the legislature is going to be all about economic recovery and response to COVID-19. We'll see. And I, and I think I think that gets to the same point of what John was saying too. You know, if, if there is a point um, at reassessment, um, and that is point of sale, it doesn't drive needing to make land use decisions based solely on fiscal growth. Um, and you can make land use decisions based on what's the best land use. And, and, and hopefully that will happen. Again, I don't want to. I don't want to single out and punish local governments in Nevada because they really are caught between a rock and a hard place. Um, you know, fiscalization of land use has always been viewed as a bad thing to do, uh, but when you're faced with an impossible set of weird incentives from a fiscal standpoint. Uh, I would say every local government in Nevada, every municipality, every county, every school district, they are making the absolute best decisions they possibly can given a crazy set of fiscal pressures and incentives that they have to deal with. Floyd, I saw your hand go up. Did you have another question? Yeah, as a former California resident for one third of my life, <laughs> uh, we could talk for hours about the ill effects of Prop 13 but the most egregious one is that it perversely limits increases in tax revenue because people never sell their house and never move. And that has major public policy impacts to school districts, police, fire, everything that you're trying to raise money for to maintain services. Um, you end up aging cities by having nobody ever move until they die. It's a, it's, it's a real challenge. Of course, in California, you know, I'd make the argument that, and, and certainly the impacts of Prop 13 in California have been well documented and they're very clear the negative impacts they have. Uh, but they've been able to weather the storm a little bit better than we have, I think. I'm, you know, similar to our response to the property tax abatements. And again, that goes to the fact that California's economic base is simply more diverse you know, than Nevada's economic base. Um, you know, in this state, and again, my hat's off to every economic development professional in the state uh, that has worked tirelessly to diversify the state's economy. Regardless of all that activity, Nevada is still one of the least diverse states in terms of its economy in the country. You know, 60% of all jobs in the state of Nevada are tied to the 10 block strip of unincorporated Clark County. That's, that is not a diverse economy uh, because any impact to that 10 block unincorporated strip of Clark County, the strip where all the resort properties are, translates into mega disasters for the state's economy and subsequently the fiscal system as well. Um, and, and again, going back to Romanzo's comments back in 1918, our fiscal system is the result of many fiscal systems being jammed together as people move to the state. So we don't have anything that's truly a Nevada fiscal system. We have components from other states and we're starting to see that that hodgepodge frankenstein is approach just doesn't work anymore. Um, especially if we look at the last 10 years of the state's general fund and general revenues. 
where four out of seven years saw decreases in revenue, but five of seven years saw increases in expenditures. That is not sustainable, right? Sooner or later, the lines cross and you're not generating enough revenue to cover expenditures. And the only thing you can do, because you can't deficit spend as a city, a county, a school district, or a state government, you have to start cutting expenditures. And that means critical public services will not be funded and provided to a growing population and a growing economic system. So ends the rant. We have a minute or two left. Any other, any other quick questions? Fred, I have a question, Hope Sullivan. Um, first, great session. I really enjoyed it and I hope you'll do it again in a month when we have more data. Um, you clearly understand a lot that I don't. So a little bit off subject, but knowing what you know, what would be the right tax structure for Nevada that would be sustainable? Well, first and foremost, it goes back to, to looking at the economic base and developing a tax base which coincides with the economic base. Um, you know, a lot of our economic activity in the last decade, for example, was really tied to the fortunes of the housing market and increased population growth and more population coming into the state. Uh, but as we've already kind of discussed, we've placed these kind of artificial caps on being able to capture value from that increased economic activity related to new construction and new residential development. And as a result now, we're not generating enough revenue to cover the cost of providing services to those residential properties at either a state or local level. Um, that's one small component of, again, this black box that is the Nevada's fiscal system. Um, what, what I would say is we're getting closer and closer to the day where a state constitutional convention is needed and a top to bottom throwing out and rebuilding of the Nevada fiscal system is needed. Um, it, it's too Frankenstein-isk at this point. Um, and, and again, like I said at the very beginning, I'd like to consider myself one of the most knowledgeable people about how Nevada's fiscal system works. I've been studying it every day, every year for the last 20 years. And I understand maybe about 15, 20% of how it works. You know, that's, that's not good. Uh, <laughs> you, you know, that's, that's too much of a black box and it creates high levels of uncertainty and unpredictability one fiscal year to the next for local governments all the way up to the state government. Um, and I think we're getting close to that day. I, I think we're getting close to the day where the public sector and even the private sector says, this isn't working anymore. I mean, if you're a private sector interest, you want predictability, right? Like if you're going to spend $50 million on a piece of equipment that you're going to depreciate over a 20 year schedule, you need to know with absolute certainty how that new purchase is going to be taxed and depreciated from one year to the next over a 20 year period. And honestly, I don't think that predictability exists in Nevada's current fiscal system. And, and I think again, that lack of predictability and uncertainty creates a whole set of bad incentives for the state government, local governments, and even the private sector. Uh, and I think there's again, growing support for the idea that we need to comprehensively rethink our fiscal system because it just isn't working in ways that are predictable and sustainable today. How that fiscal system works, I have no real idea. Um, I could go point by point in different parts, uh, but we don't have five hours. So I'll, I'll, I'll punt it as all good economists and academics. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're, we're over our one o'clock uh, end, end time. I'm, I'm happy to, to stay on uh, with anybody that wants to talk a little bit more, uh, but I know that some of you probably have to get back to life, whatever life looks like these days. Uh, I misspoke. Uh, our next APA online educational luncheon will actually be Wednesday, June 11th. And again, we'll have representatives from the RTC of Washoe County and the Reno Tahoe International Airport. Um, once I have a flyer uh, with all the details, I will send each one of you that information as well as the chapter membership. And I hope that you'll be able to join us again in two weeks. Uh, and then after that, we'll have another uh, APA online educational luncheon. 
uh, along with other events coming up. Um, those of you interested, uh, again, the chapter, the APA, Nevada APA is still working on development of the fall 2020 conference uh, for the chapter that'll be held in October. Uh, we're still working on format and trying to figure it out. We'll get that information to you as soon as we have it. Uh, but again, nominations for our De Beer Awards are now open. Um, I strongly encourage you to nominate yourself, your organization, or someone else. Uh, as we always like a nice competitive award season. Uh, so thank you very much uh, to those of you that have joined us. Uh, again, I'll stay on uh, for a few more minutes if there's anybody that would like to continue to talk. Uh, but for the rest of you, thank you very much. Have a wonderful rest of your week. Thank you. Fred, thank you very much. So Fred, this is Lori Bagwell. Hi, Lori. When do you see that you think some hard numbers will be coming to towards you that you can actually predict things? Is that three months out, four months? What do you think? Uh, we're, we're just finishing up, uh, or let's see, let's see, uh, January, February, March is first quarter, so we're in the middle of the second quarter of the year. Um, that takes us uh, January, February, March, April, May, June, probably end of June, beginning of July is when we'll actually start getting numbers on things like median household income, per capita income, uh, and other, other measures of economic activity. Uh, thankfully, the Bureau of Labor Statistics gives us monthly um, updates on the unemployment rate. And that's why we have that number right now. Uh, but I expect another month or so where we'll begin to really see kind of a larger uh, economic picture of the impacts. So I, I heard you say that you thought that with the governor's 12% for next fiscal year, you're not anticipating that deeper cuts will be needing. You're already able to kind of predict the 12% will hold. Uh, the 12% the cut that's for fiscal year 2020, 2021, say that five times fast. Uh, that's the current uh, call to cut from spending from the governor. Uh, me personally, uh, based upon the data I'm looking at, um, I think that number is going to go up. Um, I think that the legislature is either going to have to consider a special session um, prior to the actual next session in January that starts, or may use the next session uh, to consider additional cuts to the current, to the, to the or coming fiscal year of 2020, 2021. Um, as many of you know that are still with us, uh, the governor uh, has already declared an economic and fiscal emergency in the state, which allowed the uh, state government to start tapping the rainy day fund. Um, if that gets us through the next fiscal year, I'd be amazed. I, I, I think that additional cuts are going to be needed. Um, the, the cut of 12 to 14 percent is, is probably not going to cover the actual decline in revenue that we're going to see in 2020, 2021. And again, that's tied to the fact that we have no idea right. when the world's going to reopen. You know, when are, you know, tourists from Europe and China and other parts of Southeast Asia be gonna, going to be able to come to Las Vegas again? We have no idea. Um, and if, it, if there's any seasonal, seasonal variability in this virus, COVID-19, and we see a second hump or a second spike, uh, maybe in the fall in the United States, you know, August, September, October, November. And if there's no vaccine, if there's no antivirals, you're right back where we are today, you know, and back in March and most of, you know, April. Um, so there's just so much unpredictability, uncertainty, because the, the train wreck is still unfolding, it's still happening. Uh, but to answer your question, I think that the cut that we saw for 2020, 2021 is only the beginning. I, 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 and I, because I don't think that takes into consideration the impacts at the local government level and what municipalities, counties, and especially school districts, because of the state distributive school fund, are going to be asking the legislature and the state government for it. The impacts there are still unfolding. We don't know what those impacts are. Well, because a lot of people don't realize the school distributive account has to make up the local loss to the school district. And we so it's it's not just one hit for the state, it comes the other way for the school on top of it. For, for those of you that don't know what the state distributive school fund is, the way 
<laughs> and I really don't want to open Pandora's box because the way we fund education in Nevada is a quirky system as well. Uh, but for the most part, at least on the operation side of the equation for school districts, they're mandated to fill projected expenditures with local government sources first, predominantly property tax, some sales tax, and some other stuff. Mm -hmm. Then after they've determined how much revenue they have at the local level, they then say to the state government, we are now X amount of dollars short from meeting what is called the state per pupil spending minimum. Right. Mm -hmm. So if local government, if the local school district can generate four thousand dollars and the per pupil minimum at the state level is set at five thousand, the state is now on the hook to essentially backfill that missing thousand dollars per pupil per student for that local school district. But you don't know what what that difference between local sources and the state distributive school fund is going to be until the local revenue sources are worked out. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a real double whammy on education funding and we, we just don't know. It's far too early to make a logical guess, but I know that school districts are very, very attentive and focusing on that issue right now. And I imagine the Department of Taxation, the interim finance committee, everybody at the state level is keeping a very close eye on that as well because that could be a severe double whammy for the state. Well, do you think that will be one of the potential special sessions or something to say the kids weren't in school, they were homeschooled essentially, and therefore they would lower that per pupil to be able to get out of this terrible economic hole? Very well could be, um, but I don't, I, I don't see any appetite by anybody of lowering the per pupil minimum funding. Um, that's a holy grail, holy grail. <laughs> yeah, in Nevada. Uh, good luck getting anybody to support a reduction of the per pupil funding minimum. Uh, if anything, it may go up. And there, there's an argument for it to go up because school districts in particular have had to completely redesign the way they teach, right? You, you know, moving to an online format. Um, I, I mean, school districts are still operating. They're just operating in a totally different way. And that's created expenditures that they weren't anticipating on an operation side. Uh, but again, it's all, all conjecture right now. Uh, if I had that crystal ball, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. No problem. Any other questions, comments for the, for the group of the whole? No, thanks, Fred. All right. Well, thanks again for everyone. Uh, you know how to get a hold of me. If you do have a follow-up question, fred at unr.edu, more than happy to chat with you online. And again, thanks to everyone. Stay safe, stay healthy.